I, I guess some of the things, um, you know, from as an outsider that you hear about uh, uh, about Rowan at Caversham, uh, some of the, the the training camps and the load, and in particular that camp in the Sierra Nevada, the altitude camp, the, the land based camp. I mean, um, I think there was a film. I think it was maybe John Collins was was filmed. You know, bit of bit of tears and crying about you know just the tiredness. How how tough is that camp, and is is that something that you'd look to have in the German system? It's the it's a camp of champions. You know, you make your champions there. That's what you do. Um, so I have a I have a mentor um, over years now. You know, I, I came across that in 2013 because uh, UK Sport, you know, had this uh, leadership um, uh, course that they allowed me to take part in. So it was very good. And he was um, he was uh, with the SAS for many, many years, and he ended up as, a, as an, uh, um, a trainer there, you know, to, to bringing new, new recruits or people that want to become, want to go to the SAS, you know, they go, um, they get tested there, you know, and they do so a crueling process, and they end up in the jungle, so that's the end. And so we don't discuss that now, you know, and, they, and he said, we're not going to the jungle because it's hot there and rains a lot or whatever we go to the jungle to find out about the character of the person because if you go into a war and if you go in a group and it's life and death you need to know about the character of people they don't want the fittest guy they don't want the guy that can run half naked for three hours to the jungle and be unaffected they want the guy that has the right character and can be a team player when he is almost at the end of his tether that's what they want and why do they want this? Because they want to survive, you know? So we row only, they go out and fight. So what's good for them is good for us. So Sierra Nevada teaches you about your character, partially, and the training comes with it, you know? Because if you can do it there, you can do, you can do it in many other places. Yeah. So I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I read your book and, and the point of these things is you, you, you were tested all the time. You know, there were many times you, didn't need to do it, you could have walked away, you could have done this, could have done that. They were not pleasant moments, but those are the moments that defined you. And then you were rewarded at the end of your journey or of, of one of your journeys with, with a gold medal. You know, but it was not given, it was not, uh, you know, you, you had to go so on other big problems. And I think that's what we have to understand. Overcoming toughness and, 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 a, and a horrible time is not bad. It teaches you a lot. You know, we, we should we should relish these moments to go out there and push the boundaries. You know, yeah, that's a that's a great answer, Christian. Thank you for that. Um, can I um, have a look at um, in 2016? You were um, coaching the eight with Jurgen Grobler. Um, I'm, I'm I'm interested in how co-coaching with a guy like Jurgen Grobler works because he he always wants to take the lead boat. He wants to be the one that's doing it. I mean, what what do you bring to a party when you're co-coaching with Jurgen Grobler? And what indeed did you bring to that eight in 2016? That's okay. I mean, this is a fair question. I, I, I you know, I always say it in these times. I don't want to uh, overestimate my my input. There, it's very difficult. I, I, I might not be able to answer this so easily, um, but. You know, the, the, I wouldn't say, you know, the word co-coaching is then a bit tricky. It was clearly he was the lead coach. He was leading everything. So it was it's a very different operation to coaching a four, you know. Um, but of the other, on the other hand, for me, I think it was an absolute fantastic opportunity to be there every session. I mean, I've, I've been there anyway most of the time, but actually doing it session by session, discussing things. Um, and, you know, on, on the upside... It, so, so it's, it's a different involvement to when you do it yourself. But of course, the upside is you can suddenly can look a little bit more relaxed, sort of one step removed, you know, because uh, he, he was doing the coaching and then we, we discussed a lot. So I think it was done in discussion and uh, it takes, takes a lot of talking. And for me, just to understand how he works, where I could add something to it, when I speak, when I'm not speaking, sort of get an idea how, how that works. And uh, so it wasn't for me, uh, I didn't feel like uh, going in there and inserting myself too much. In the end, it worked quite well. You know, we had some, some meetings, some discussions. 
uh, where I could develop some ideas what we want to try, how we can do it better, especially when some races didn't go so well, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was a it's, it was a, again a different experience, you know. I've done now co-coaching uh, a few times, yeah. interestingly enough, and it was a, of course every time it's a completely different dynamic, you know. Now I'm just trying, you know, my idea is often then to hold things together and finding ways uh, of of getting getting everyone to operate and at their best level. That's what I'm thinking. Um, that's maybe one of my strengths, you know, to not tell people what to do and try to push them into my mold or what I, rather to find out what a person can do and then see if I can't can't amplify this. Yeah. So you, what, was it different, your co-coaching experience with John West in 2010 and, and in uh, twenty in the 2012 Olympics? Um, I, I get the impression you were more uh, on the sort of more like equals on that on that sort of level. Um, 2012, yeah. 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 And then, you know, that was my first one. Or oh, we started in 2010 already. And I, I must give, and I want to give an enormous amount of credit to John West, you know, because uh, when, when I started there with him, he was already in the system for, for quite a while. I think he came back from the Olympics anyway with a silver medal in 2008 and um, so on. And he, he, was, he was keen. You know, you meet, I, I tell you now, there are a lot of coaches who wouldn't want to do this. They, they don't like it. I find it stressful and difficult, um, and uh, it's it's not easy. You have to talk a lot, and and that's what we did. We started off talking a lot. So basically, we were coaching, then sitting, talking things through. Everyone had a different angle. So I think uh, over time, then then we could operate very well. So if he if he wasn't there, I could do uh, work with the aid. If he was there, he could do with the work with the aid. We did things together at the regatta. So then in the end, it worked quite well, but it needs a lot of amount of, of talking and also discussing how one wants to operate with each other, you know? So we had this idea that um, you, you're back your colleague, even if it's something different to what you perceived should have happened at least twice, yeah? Then you go afterwards and you find out what happened with the change, but you before you really think it's a problem because you know life's life. If you immediately get stressed just because something changes, but it's also not a very good idea to immediately jump in and say no, this we didn't agree, we don't, we we don't do that. So we wanted to back ourselves no matter what because you can imagine with nine rowers and two coaches, there's a lot of communication that can go on and and create confusion. So we try to. Elim el eliminate as much of that as we could. Yeah, I mean, you must be one of the the best qualified co coaches in the world because I'm trying to think of other examples of, of where that happens, and um, and I can't think of many. No, no, no. I, I, I think I think it's a, it's a, it's a, something I, I like to do. You know, I like to work with people. I, as well, I'm thinking. Um, is is a good uh, good way of of using utilizing these these um, ideas now in my new job is I don't want to tell people what to do I don't want them to do what I want to do as such I just want to create a situation where we have um, uh, principles and and values saying okay this this is what we want and then you can you have a lot of space you can you can work with it we just have to have a bit of an understanding and then and then i think people can bring themselves in otherwise you don't get new ideas in you don't you don't you can't do anything if you only stick to your own plan it works if you're on, on your own okay that's what you do but i do believe even coaches that i work on their own they they look over the fence here and there or go to a um, um symposium or somewhere discuss something and then come back and and uh, use those ideas we just had to do it a little bit quicker and we did it between the two of us, you know. Yeah, in that that eight in twenty twelve, um, there, there was a lot of disappointment. Um, I think uh, at the end of that bronze medal race, that um, the eight hadn't won gold uh, from some of the athletes. Um, do you think that eight delivered on its potential, or was there a way through in terms of coaching, maybe things you could have done differently that might have secured a different result in that twenty twelve Olympics? Yeah, I, I, I listened to uh, Martin Schmidt, and I can assure him we, we were ahead for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, as we always say, the last row counts, and you only win at the 2,000-meter line. So it was, a, it was a fantastic race. 
for for the Germans as well, you know. And I think you know they showed the toughness there, and that that's one of those things. Um, could yeah, you know, of course we could have done things better. We would have wished for a better result, but I think one of the problems uh, was that maybe a little bit that we were always feeling the idea we were chasing. We we're always chasing something. And I think that takes maybe a little bit the freedom away and the relaxation to do uh, your best. So it was always thought because you know in 2010 we were very close, um, very close. A few. Yeah, tenths. That's the closest yeah. we got to them, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just a few tens. And I think instead of being happy, you know, and thinking, oh yeah, good, we're 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 coming in here, we're fresh, you know. In 2009, we we were only fifth in the final, you know. But uh, the hype was such, you no, know, that that's that has to be this way. Um, and then it was just chasing. I think it was completely unnecessary. Um, I remember in 2011, it was not much different. I was, I just felt relief that we had a, a second place, you know, um, because it was again just chasing, chasing. Every every time, not winning was a loss. And so uh, I think we never developed enough freedom of just expressing yeah. ourselves, you know. And I think in 2012, a little bit the same thing was. Just chasing this. The, you, you, of course, everyone wanted to win, and I think the the guys were more than capable of winning. You know, but there is that is uh, maybe it is a difficult thing in this whole system. Remember, there was a there was a four as well, and with the, with the whole vibe, and so it's more difficult. You know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's it's if you think as a nation, you know, you 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 put out an eight, a four, and a pair in sweep. And we managed many times in between, but even at that particular Olympics, it was it was a gold and two bronze. You know, there were probably there would have been nations that would have been very happy. You know, so yeah. it, you know, the finding that balance and getting that right and having that freedom when you're in such a situation is not easy. And I, maybe I think that's what we lost the freedom to make our own decisions. You know, a little bit it was chasing the next stroke, so to speak. One of the things I think Greg Searle, who was in those eights of 2010, 2011 and 2012, uh, uh, he, he kind of looks at the eight of 2010 and he says, you know, emotionally, we were a closer unit. We, we were more together. And and he differentiates that from the crews in, in 2011 and 2012. Did, is that something you see at all? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we had some discussions afterwards. Yes, I think this the, the thing with the selection bit, and I mean, that's maybe something... That doesn't come out on the day and often is is that of course every rower you know they build alliances you you're making a crew you're making a team but you know the way it was done and always has been done is you don't come back you know okay silver medalist in 2010 everyone gets slapped on shoulder we train a year and we try it again basically you have to split and then and then it starts again wh where you get in so so by the time we came together then it was a slightly different team and not everyone was on the same page, you know? And I think maybe that is the the, the, the tricky thing. Then what we didn't do maybe well enough is to to weld into a, a, a team quickly enough once the selection is made, you know, and, and forget what happened before. And, you know, you train with your teammates in a different boat, but forget that and, and concentrate on where you are, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that could that could be made better, you know? Yeah. Um, of, of those athletes that you coached in, in those eights and indeed in, in the fours um, uh, after the Rio Olympiad, um, maybe you can talk about some of them and, and some of their qualities. I, I'm, I'm kind of resisting to say who was the best athlete you coached, but I mean, there must be, uh, you know, a number of athletes that have got, you know, some different qualities and things that have impressed you about them and uh, that, that stood out that, that you recall. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, good. It, it was it was interesting to work with someone like um, Constantine Leloudis. You know, it was a very different. That was he was a very different approach to uh, many of the others because he also kept a lot of the things that he wanted to do differently. You know, you're doing going to Oxford um, and and doing his thing there. So it was a more of a fl fluid in and out. And, uh, you know, he had some tough times with injuries and so, but he was really, I mean, he had, he had a way to roll. He had, a, had this, this rhythm feel and holding the power and these things. And, and I think he was, it was, uh, it was, was an interesting person to work with and, and really one, um, I felt, you know, he had a, an, a conviction about himself 
you know, which I think is quite important. And that's what I try to tell younger athletes, you know, to to relax a little bit and really concentrate on themselves and trust themselves a little bit, especially when it goes wrong. I can't look into his head if sure there were moments when he was screaming out, you know. It was the same a little bit with somebody like George Nash, you know. I work with him uh, quite a bit because I coached a pair with uh, Will Satch and George Nash. Two people that are completely different. I mean, like really, really different. But they worked really well together. And, and George Nash, the reason why he sticks out, and, and another story I, I tell a lot is we we um, we did selections, you know, the, the whole year. But in the end, we did seat racing. And George Nash lost to, uh, to um, Tom Ransley by two tenths of a, of a, a second. And he was he was really upset that he didn't get in, you know. So then, but then the next day he came. He was in the pair with Will Satch, and they never looked back. You know, he really he wasn't looking over his shoulder. He wasn't talking about what where he could have been. He he hopped into that boat and he made it go. And he worked for it. And he was one hundred percent committed. Yeah. And I think that's maybe what some of the rowers sometimes had difficulties with. Once this election was finished, they couldn't move on. Yeah. So there, so there was always a part of their soul was where they thought there should have been, you know, and that can that can be difficult, you know, it can be difficult if you if you can't really sort of let go and then move forward uh, um, within a short period of time. I guess the intensity sometimes, you know, if you, the intensive selection is very high, but the ones who could move on, I think, it uh, makes it easier. Yeah, that's a great story, Christian. Um, mm. In terms of uh, in terms of the way you like people to row, I know that you have said you know one of your influences was Harry Marl and the way that that Harry coached. Um, what would you say about the way you like people to row, and how have you been influenced by someone like Harry Marl? And what what's the hallmark of a Christian Felkel crew? Um, yeah, look, I mean, I think that's there is a, still a little bit the art, you know, because. Because if you think of it, if you if you add the numbers up and people have done that, you know, and you can see it in a board, uh, even in a pair or for any board, is uh, you put very, two very strong people together and they're not very fast, funnily enough. And then others, they, they roll very quickly. Um, and I'm not even saying, you know, and, and you can see there are different ways of rowing it. If you, know, if you look at different pairs and different fours, they look differently but had enormous success at the time, you know. I do think it's important, and I, I guess one of the main understandings is, is the idea of, of rhythm, you know, that there's a rhythm between how you propel your boat and how you let the boat run. And I think a bit of an understanding, that's that's what came out, that's what I try to teach people, to listen to the boat. So if you could imagine the boat could also talk, yeah, so you have a pair, and of course, they, you know, these guys can talk to each other or they shout out frustrations, but the boat also talks, yeah. The, and the boat has also frustrations. If you kick it all the time, you can imagine how that boat thinks for crying out loud, why are you doing this now? You know, you noticed already it's not going very far. You're still kicking me. So I think to try maybe to bring the voice of the boat into the equation and, and, and say, listen, feel what, what is going on underneath your seat. What's going on under the water? How does it sound? How does it feel? Is it actually moving? You know, or you're just repeating one thing. And if you feel you're too slow, you go harder. You know, and that is something that's what people do often. And I think to teach them that you don't need to row harder, you need to row faster. So we have to find ways to row faster, not harder. Um, which sounds logic when you say it, but yeah. often I see people just row harder. Oh, no, harder. Come, you need to go harder. Oh, I didn't win. Maybe I didn't go hard enough. No, you didn't go fast enough. You, you have to accelerate the boat to the highest possible speed and then hold it there, you know? So the, the two, and also the, the, the real understanding that there are these two very, very different systems, the, the propel, propulsion or the acceleration of the boat, and then the part where you can do absolute nothing but not disturb, you know? So if you can, you have to do everything, and then you have to do nothing, if you think of that way, nothing, don't do anything that stops this boat, yeah? But then do everything, to bring it up to speed again. There is a natural uh, speed loss and you can learn that and then you have the rhythm. Yeah. So, you know, thinking, thinking in that kind of terms, that's, that's what, I, what I do, I, you know, sound and feel and, uh, you know, and you can watch it. I mean, watch the um, 2016-8, yeah, and watch the faces. 
108 rows. You know, you know, it's, it's completely different. These people were just in the rhythm. The phases were concentrating, but they look, look if you see the phases in 2012, they look different. Yeah. yeah. They have to try, we must try, we must, we must, we must, you know. In 2016, they're just moving that boat as hard as they could. Yeah. yeah. It's not like the, that it were perfect, but if you see how everyone tuned in, the faces were very different. And I think then you can see already how, how people can start learning, or how people can move a boat, you know. And that's, that's uh, I often speak about Usain Bolt. I said, if you think of Usain Bolt, he gets 100 meters, he runs under 10 seconds, under nine seconds, yeah. And still there, there are phases. You know, he goes out, you duck down, you go very hard, very fast, but then you have to open out. You have to open up, the legs have to get longer, the rhythm. If that's not coming, it's it. You can't win. You can't. You have to come out. And in rowing, it's the same thing. To come out, to relax, even in all that intensity. And what is more intense than 100-meter run, you know? But still there, you see, between each stroke, he, when, he, when, he, when he touches the ground, he relaxes. You know, energy, relax. Energy, relax. Another rhythm. So I think that's maybe... The best I can describe my ideas of rowing. That's that's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs>